Delighted to be joined by Irish Women's Hockey International, uh, Chloe Watkins, uh, who also plays for our club, Monk Monkstown, for a special new feature, My Top 5 Games. Uh, Chloe has made over 200 appearances for Ireland uh, since 2010. I suppose, Chloe, before we start the countdown, uh, in relation to this, it's a, it's a sort of a fun sort of subject. Uh, it can be any game for you, whether from club or country, but the one option then is your wild card in, in your top five. That game can be from, it's a game that you haven't taken part of, and it can be from any other sport, okay? Yeah, sounds good. I, I already have it in mind. Uh, yeah. so. Okay, so, so, so uh, Chloe, we'll start off. So uh, your number five, uh, we'll begin the countdown, and uh, what's, what for you is the fifth game for you? So... The fifth, um, I think the fifth best comeback I've been involved with was, um, it was with Ireland, all right. Uh, we were playing in a tournament in New Zealand in 2016 and it was, we had just missed out on, on qualifying for Rio and it was kind of our first tournament back together as a squad. So it was quite, um, you know, tough to get back together. And we were, we were playing in a, a, a prep tournament for Rio essentially so it was all these higher ranked teams and it was a very good uh, quality tournament so we were one of the lowest ranked we were playing Korea though um, I remember in the uh, fourth and fifth place playoff no the fifth and sixth place playoff and uh, we were three nil down with five minutes to go and um, we scored we somehow got three goals in the last five minutes we, we ended up getting one and then with a minute and a half left on the clock, uh, mm. we worked the ball down the other end. Uh, it came off the keeper and I for, I don't score that many goals. So it dropped to me in the circle and I finished it for 3-2. And then 20 seconds left on the clock, we uh, managed to get the ball back, go down their end and score the equaliser with ultimately the last gasp uh, effort of the game. And we went on then to win the shootout and beat them. So we ended up fifth, which was great. Uh, but it was it was quite dramatic. <laughs> and I suppose, Chloe, I suppose that is uh, showing one of the greatest uh, comebacks, I suppose, in terms of your hockey career being down 3 But the afterthought of that, going home that evening, I suppose the euphoria, that, does it maybe was to come two or three days afterwards before it sank in and you sort of relive that game in your head and the memories of it? And was that sort of, that's that why it stayed with you? Yeah, I think um, it was it was kind of um, a milestone for us in a way as a squad because, as I said, we had missed out on qualification for Rio really narrowly. Um, we actually lost out in a, sh in a shootout, um, penalty shootout. And that was really, really tough to take, obviously. Um, you know, training for Olympics is a four-year cycle. So this was like getting the squad back together trying to get morale back up and, and focusing for the next cycle, which was uh, the, the World Cup. Mm. So that was our first tournament. And I suppose we kind of got rid of all the ghosts and demons from the shootout loss by winning this one uh, in such a dramatic fashion, coming back from 3-0 down. So it was quite, uh, it, was like, it was like a new era for our squad, I think. Uh, Chloe, we'll move on to the fourth spot now and uh, we'll pick your brain again And uh, in terms of what, what comes to mind, whether it's uh, yesteryear or closer at hand. Um, it's a little bit closer. Um, it's, it's from 2017. So we were at the World Cup qualifiers uh, in Johannesburg. Um, and again, you know, qualifying for tournaments like World Cup and Olympics and hockey is, is extremely difficult. These tournaments are really, really tough. So uh, we found ourselves in a match against India, uh, which we had to win. And we were 1-0 down uh, with one quarter of hockey to go. So about 15 minutes left. Um, and, you know, again, we had trained for about two years for this. And uh, it was quite a high stakes game, I suppose. And conditions were tough as well, you know, yeah. in Joburg altitude and everything else so um we ended up equalizing uh then our keeper saved a stroke uh, a penalty stroke um to keep us in it and then with uh, pff, about five minutes left on the clock uh we got a corner a short corner and and got the winner from that 2-1 and it was just a and it was an incredible comeback and that that ultimately qualified us for the world cup uh which which gave us so much success <laughs> 
Yeah, and I suppose, Chloe, you talk about that game, a, a winner-take-all sort of game, and the tension and, and the build-up going into that game. Two years on the line, it all comes down to roughly uh, one hour, one game, uh, one result, uh, winner-takes-all. So, so you're either going home that day a winner or a loser after two years of your life's work. Exactly, yeah. Um, that's it. And when you're you're one nil down in a game like that, um, you know you have to pull. Um, you have to pull the the strength from somewhere. And I think we could have, you know, tanked and we could have uh, ended up losing it, or we came out fighting. And I think probably our previous um, losses all gave us the experience to deal with that kind of pressure um, and we just stayed composed and we just played just kept playing and sticking to the process and was really composed on the ball and we managed to to work two opportunities for ourselves and get two goals in the last 15 minutes yeah and uh before i move you on to your 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 third option there i suppose an awful lot of uh primary games in terms of hockey it's uh defining moments it's uh, in terms of penalty penalty corners uh, in terms of uh, flicks in terms of last ditch sort of sort of tackles and uh, in games like that you sort of it's the moments rather than the match itself you sort of remember yeah absolutely well i think they're they're the moments that win and lose you games um those set pieces or those uh high pressure moments and giving yourself an opportunity to convert one of them is is all you can do so uh, we managed to to create an opportunity for ourselves and and win a corner. So then converting it under pressure is you know you practice corners in every single session you go out in training. So they're the kind of moments you're trying to create for yourself, um, and then you execute it. It's it's really satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose, Chloe, we'll move on to the number three spot. You haven't used your wild card uh, sort of pick yet. Is it coming into play here? Well, uh, no, but I'll, I'm going to be going back a few years now with yeah. this one. Um, this is from 2010. Uh, from Sorry, yeah, 2010. Uh, from school, from my school days. Um, okay. It was in the All-Ireland Schools Championships. Um, and my school, I was in sixth year. But we had never won the the champ the All Irelands in our school's history, so it was a big deal, um, getting there and everything else. So we were in the semi final. It was it wasn't even the final. We okay. We ended up winning the final three one, and it was a far less pressure game than the semi final. Uh, I think we were up kind of against the favourites in the semi final, but we were three 0 down, twenty minutes to go, and we had to to uh, obviously win it to get to the final. Yeah. Uh, and we ended up uh, scoring a goal uh, from our, our left back scored a goal. It was like a, a wonder goal. Um, then I scored a penalty stroke to go 3-2. And then again, it's your short corners and your set pieces. We managed to to keep at them. And we won one in the last, literally the last second. The final whistle blew. So you, you play out the corners in hockey. Yeah. Uh, despite the, the whistle going. Um, so it was literally our last try of the game, three two down, and uh, we ended up scoring the the corner to go three all, and then took them to penalties and won in penalties. So it was crazy, and we went on to win that All Ireland's, and it was the first one in our school's history. So it was really special. Yeah, and I suppose uh, school games uh, with friends, with companions, with sort of people you grew up with for the last three or four years. It's always that sort of siege mentality. This sort of uh, mean so much more when you look back in, in terms of your career they're the starting sort of memories that sort of drove the sort of passion and sort of, you sort of drive for that and if you why well, many people underage uh, go through their sort of careers they don't really have success and it's it sort of doesn't give them that extra motivation or step some of the, it does but achieving that bit of success uh, with your friends and it sort of deepened the love or passion you sort of got a sense of that euphoria what it sort of felt like yeah absolutely I think um even even schools hockey gave me experience in in situations like that and uh that comeback and that that win was something I've drawn on all my career. Like it's it's definitely a, a memory that is one of my fondest in in my hockey career, um, and it, it gave me experience in a high pressure situation. I mean, it's at the time it was the biggest thing I, I was doing. You know, the All Irons was was the biggest thing. So, uh, 
it gave me great experience going forward. Um, and again, yeah, that love of the game, you know, doing it with your friends, especially when you're in sixth year and you're, you know, it's your last, it's your last year of school hockey. Um, I think it makes it all that bit more special. Um, and yeah, it was just a great occasion. Yeah, I suppose, Chloe, before we move on to number two, it's important to, and an awful lot of people, uh, an awful lot of young girls uh, playing hockey in, in their schools in their final years. And when you go back, to, uh, if you go back and you see sort of those sort of games, does it sort of take you back to, uh, cast you back a sort of a, a time travel sort of sense and you can sort of see yourself in those sort of shoes and sort of picture yourself as a young girl uh, reliving those moments? Yeah, I'm jealous of, of any school girl at the moment. Uh, I always say that whenever... Um, I go and see my school play to this day. You know, they were, they were the glory days. They're the days that you you really look back and are most fond of. Um, it's where it all started and where you you just played with your your friends and you were really competitive against other schools, playing against your friends. Um, and it was it was a great environment to be in. And yeah, I'm very jealous of them now getting to do it. I'd love to I'd love to go back and do it all over again. Uh, Chloe, we'll move you on now. Uh, to say uh, second uh, place is uh, the place uh, best served, uh, not best served. Uh, no one likes coming uh, second when it's a, a two horse sort of race. And who is the unlucky uh, opponent? Is it your wild card or another sort of hockey memory? Uh, yeah, it's my, it's my wild card, all right. Um, so I'm a Liverpool football club. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan. So yeah. just to say, uh, well, up until last year and, and the Barcelona comeback, it, it was Istanbul in 2005, uh, the Champions League final. I mean, that's, that was one of the greatest comebacks that I've ever witnessed. Um, probably more biased because I'm a, a fan, but uh, I remember exactly where I was watching it in my brother's room when I was about, I don't know, 12 at the time. Uh, and it was just, it was incredible to come back from 3-0 down against Milan, who were out and out favourites. Um, and to, to go through penalties and win, it was really inspiring. I suppose, Chloe, when I suppose your memories, you said you're only a 12 year old girl at that stage, but your memories there, sitting there at half time, seeing your favourite team, Trina Dom, I suppose the tears coming from your eyes, you think it's possibly gone, you think there's no way that it, co it come back. And you start to see a comeback like that in terms of another sport, the so-called impossible uh, made possible. Do you sort of get a sense then that everything is not done until the final whistle is blown in any sport? Absolutely. Um, you know, witnessing something like that literally teaches you to not give up until the final whistle. And definitely, you know, it gives you that belief that no matter how, what the score is, there's still time. And it only takes a matter of seconds to score a goal so um that, witnessing things like that definitely has been something I've drawn on during my career and I I literally now I never give up until the final whistle you know a matter of seconds can change a game and that's uh definitely uh, something from experience and uh watching Liverpool <laughs> in 2005. And you mentioned there that uh, you are a Liverpool fan and I suppose you followed uh, Liverpool through all the good and the bad and I suppose in terms of what we're seeing at the moment, in terms of uh, Liverpool being so close uh, to winning the league, you're supposed to have, you must be biting at the bit to see the, the remaining uh, two games we finish up to see Liverpool cross the line and claim that Premier League title. Oh, absolutely. Um, it brings a lot of my non Liverpool uh, friends a lot of joy to see me in this agony. Um, but yeah, oh, look, we were so close, literally, as you said, a game or two away from it. Um, so it's it's a bit bittersweet uh, not being able to see them lift the trophy and have the parade down Liverpool uh, in the bus. But I think no matter who you support, it's it's kind of undeniable that we are 25 points or whatever ahead, that uh, it was probably ours wrapped. So, um, you know, hopefully we've got a great coach. Uh, we've got a great manager, sorry, in, in Jurgen Klopp. We've got a really great squad at the moment. So hopefully things can stay together. Um, they can build on this season and... And hopefully we'll see Premier League back next year and, and Liverpool lift the cup for real. 
And I suppose, Chloe, before I move you on to your number one moment there, in terms of being practically a professional hockey player, in terms of uh, club and in terms of country and the schedule that it involves, you know, when you're not with country, you're involved with club. Do you ever get a t chance to fulfil your pastimes, like go over to Anfield, say, get in to take in a game or two once a year? Or is that, uh, uh, as Ireland have got more successful in the last few years in the schedule, in terms of qualifying the Olympics, does that become... A rare, rare occasion for you? Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's probably uh, more rare than I would like. Um, I remember it was 2017, um, Stevens's day. We got I got over with my brother. Um, my dad get, got us tickets for Christmas, and we had a a week or two off over Christmas. So it was really a great time. Um, we got over to a Stoke City game. We won four one, and there was loads of goals. It was brilliant. So. Uh, that was probably, that was my last visit. So, I, you know, we had been looking at uh, tickets for the sort of April period. Right. Uh, a few months ago, all right, because we were fancying our chances. But uh, look, you can't really predict what was going to happen. But um, I'd like to get over a bit more frequently. Hopefully uh, in the future, I'll be able to. And uh, Chloe, I suppose we've gone from five to four to three. Uh, to two, we now come to the top spots so far. I suppose there's many more memories and many games left to play for you, Chloe Watkins, in your career so far. But as the saying goes, we're all stopped at the moment. So as time stands still, what is the number one spot for you? Um, the number one spot for me, and this is still a comeback, even though it was after after a regular time, uh, has to be our Olympic qualifiers. Um, we you know, qualifying for Tokyo, we were 3-1 down in that shootout and we had to score, that was 3-1 down after three rounds, so mm. we had to score our last two and we had to save our, our last two and uh, we managed we managed to pull it out of the bag. It was really against all odds, I think, um, when you're 3-1 down in a shootout and we, we managed to score the two, get it to, to a sudden death and we won, so I think that's probably um, going to be top spot for a while. That was trying to you know qualify for Tokyo which we did uh, it was a lifelong dream so I think that has to be my number one <laughs> yeah and uh, Chloe that is the, the number one a lifelong dream for you qualifying for the Olympics and you mentioned there about the shootout the pressure of having to convert the penalties but also I suppose we do sometimes normally forget that in order for you to score they still had to miss and someone had to make the saves and Aisha so many times in the past years for this hockey team when the chips are down she's always came out trump three and for some of your memories in, in terms of getting to a world cup final getting to olympics uh isha has uh, uh, played a big part in for all the team and panel fulfilling those dreams for you yeah absolutely um like we we, we couldn't have done it without her and i know she said before that um we give her confidence when we're we're stepping up to take them, but she gives us confidence when we're as a taker. I, I I took one of the penalties, and without a doubt, I get confidence from her making saves. Um, and she's done that time and again for us. So it it really does give you a boost. But it was no easy feat, and uh, she she admitted halfway through when we were three one down, she was she thought we had we had lost it, and she she admitted that to me. I was rooming with her. Um, and then, you know, we score and it gives her a little bit of hope. Then she makes a save. It gives us a bit of hope. So it was kind of back and forth. Um, and I just, I think most people probably thought we were down and out. But, uh, you know, you just got to stick to, to what's coming up next, each one as they come. And uh, we managed to do that. And uh, Chloe, lastly, before I let you go, uh, we've seen the Olympics, the 2020 Olympics is going to be 2021 Olympics all going to plan if we, this pandemic, if it comes to an end uh, fairly soon. But you were sort of based your whole life for the last two or three years around this sort of a cycle. An extra year has been added to that now in terms of the offset, in terms of the time out uh, from the squad, in terms of the time off from that sort of schedule has it given you a sort of a, a reflection on other aspects of life and have you taken stock and measure uh, of the other what's of what other elements of life dare i say it yeah no absolutely i mean i don't think you could ever foresee a, an olympics being postponed it's the first time in its history so uh it kind of makes everything that bit more real um it kind of brings it down to earth a bit i suppose as well 
but another year um, of planning our life around uh, training for the Olympics. So it's, it's difficult balancing things with work. Um, we, are, we have been full-time training, but yeah. at the same time, it's, it's, it's not professional. Um, yeah. So thankfully, our employers have been you know, understanding enough. I've been able to go back to work for the last um, month and we'll continue to do so until we're able to get back into full-time training, which is great. Uh, but yeah, it does kind of get you back in check and, and realize that sport isn't, um, you know, it, it's, it's not the be all and end all. There's a lot bigger things in life. Um, and the Olympics isn't something that uh, will, will just happen. So it's kind of given us another sense of motivation, definitely, uh, in order to get there. So we just need to hopefully all get through this um, and be back out on the pitch soon enough. Uh, Chloe Watkins, on that note, uh, thanks for taking part. Uh, they are the top five moments, the top five games so far that have influenced uh, the career of uh, Chloe Watkins. Uh, stay, ch stay tuned. Next, we'll have Ken Doherty up to relive his five top moments and his top five games for his career. But for the moment, Chloe Watkins, a pleasure as always. And uh, we wish you the best And in terms of hockey and in terms of your club career. Chloe, take care. Thank you very much. Now well, back to the third, second part of my top five games. We're joined by Irish World Snooker uh, champion uh, Ken Darty. We just after speaking to Chloe Watkins, Irish Hockey uh, Women's International, she revealed her top five games moment with the with our four games plus Liverpool's comeback in Istanbul came number two for her in our personal moments of her career. I'm now delighted to be joined for the second part of this episode by Ken Darty. Uh, an Irish amateur champion, a world under 21 champion, a world amateur champion, and has also won the biggest prize in snooker, defeating uh, Stephen Hendry in 1997. So, Kim, I suppose there's been so many games, so many snooker games throughout uh, your career. Uh, to start off, we're going to begin. Um, what comes for you, whether it be from a child growing up, uh, from the amateurs, or even onto the professional scene, or even using your wild card? What for you is your fifth top game? Oh, it's a, uh, well, I started off. Um, I started off watching snooker when I was a kid. I was only eight years of age. But when I saw Alex Higgins, I think win the world championship in 1982, uh, and Dennis Taylor, of course, win it in 1985. I think they were two great iconic moments in our sport. So to be involved in one of those matches, um, uh, one of either of those finals would have been quite incredible, you know. But I think that. The Davis and Taylor going right to the black ball was incredible. Uh, and, of course, Higgins beating Ray Reardon, beating Jimmy White in that semi-final and beating Reardon in the final. That was, uh, they were two epic finals for me and two great championships. And if I could have been, if I got back to a different era, I think that era would have been fantastic to play in. So that is your fifth uh, moment. It wasn't a game that you were involved in yourself. No. So that is for you, your wild card uh, used so at number five. So we're going to bring you on. These are all games now that Ken Doherty was involved in uh, going forward. So number four, Ken, what is your selection? Uh, games I've been involved in. Oh, well, I think one of the greatest matches I was involved in that I didn't actually win, funny enough, uh, was probably Stephen Hendry when he beat me in the final of the UK Championships in 1994. Um, he had uh, six centuries uh, um, against me and was leading 7-5. And then he had seven centuries to beat me 10-5. But I was really close to him at 6-5. He only had five centuries. It was still quite a lot. And then made, and I should have been 6-all with him. And if I had gone into the interval at 6-all after him making five centuries, I think I would have been... Um, in a much better state of mind uh, than he would have been. But the fact that he made a six century and went seven five at the interval instead of six all, it sort of gave him that little bit of more of an edge. And he ended up beating me at uh, 10 five, but made another century. So he made seven centuries of the 10 frames that he won. So it was one of the greatest finals, one of the greatest matches I was ever involved in. But unfortunately, I was on, I was on the wrong end of it. I suppose, uh, Kim, before I bring you on to your third moment, you spoke about that interval being so close. And what was going mm. through your head as you came backstage to gather your uh, thoughts, to get a bit of water on? What was the I second know. part that was going to be the defining well, the, moment? Well, the, the funny thing was, uh, 
the funny thing was, Eamon Dunphy was with me, you know, in 1994. And he brought me a cup of tea into the dressing room. And the dressing rooms are, are close to each other and, and separated by uh, like a, a very sort of a, a very a wall, you know, but not a, like a, not a brick wall. It would have been just like, a, I don't know, like a, whatever. It was very light wall. And you could hear whatever was going on in the other dressing room. But Dunphy flies into the dressing room with a cup of tea in his hand and it's shaking like this, you know. And he shouts at me, you have him. You have him. He's gone. He's gone. Like, you know. And I said, Amen. I said, he's after making six centuries and seven friends. <laughs> and he says, I don't care how many centuries he's made. He says, he can't play any better. Now you go out there and you win that next frame and you'll beat him, he goes, you know. And I said, I said, keep it down, Amen. I says, he's going to hear you next door, you know. Yeah. And he shouts at the wall. He says, I hope he hears me. He's pointing to the wall. I hope he hears me because he's gone. He can't play any better. <laughs> anyway, I think it inspired Henry more than it inspired me because he went down the next frame, made another century and beat me 10 points. <laughs> so uh, that was, it was quite, but when, when, when Eamon saw him afterwards, he, uh, uh, Dunphy says to Henry, he says, Stephen, you played unbelievable. The best that's ever been. <laughs> yeah, <it> looks like <laughs> He sort of changed back to his usual self, you know. <laughs> Uh, on that note, uh, Ken, with that sort of bombshell and revelation of uh, Eamon Dunphy entering this uh, <laughs> debate, uh, for you, bringing you on uh, another game that you were involved in, uh, the top, we're entering your top three now, uh, coming in at number three for you? Oh, I think uh, at the top three, I think, let me see, I think beating John Higgins uh, in Malta uh, in the final of the Malta Open, I was... Uh, 5-2 up and uh, after the first session. And then I went 8-5 down. He won six in a row and in the evening session. And then I, I came back to win the last four to beat him 9-8. Yeah. And, and win the Malta Open. I think it was for the tour, tour time. Uh, and I think that was one of my best ever comebacks against John, against a guy who was at the top of the world. I think he was number one or number two in the world at the time. And uh, I think that was one of my greatest ever uh, finals to beat him. And we went out, we got pissed afterwards, got thrown off the plane. And uh, I was on the front pages of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the sun and the back pages for lifting the trophy. I was on the front pages of the sun for getting thrown off the plane for being drunk or looking after him because he was more drunk than I was. And uh, you mentioned that, and I suppose, Ken, you mentioned about the friendship there and uh, the companionship between professional uh, snooker players, but you're talking about finals, uh, big, massive moments. And uh, for our competitors at that stage where it's either you or him and rivals, is it, is it very easy once the game is over to put that aside and just go um, on with everyday life? With some players, yes. With other players, maybe not so. Uh, I won't mention the other players, but... Uh, Certainly with him, we were always uh, good mates and we'd always have a drink afterwards and, you know, uh, we'd always get on well and have a laugh. So if he won, I'd be the first congratulating him on buying him a drink. And if I won, he was, he was the same. Although he would have been pretty good after that final, but we still managed to go out and enjoy ourselves. Uh, Ken, we always say our second place is the place no one wants to be. It, mm. It's the place behind uh, number one. And uh, you, get no, you get no prizes before coming second in a race. And uh, for you, what is the second moment of your top five games that you have been involved in that I doesn't think... make the cupboard at one spot? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I mean, this one comes very close. It was, uh, I think, it was, I think, my greatest ever comeback. I mean, that one against John Higgins was good, but this one against Paul Hunter in the two thousand and three semi final of the World Championships, so I was fifteen nine behind, uh, forced to seven in. We have come to the last session, uh, and I was fifteen nine behind overnight. So we had one more session to play, eight uh, nine frames, and I had to win eight of the nine frames, and. Uh, I went out with the attitude and said, well, if he's going to beat me, he's going to have to win it. I'm not going to hand it to him easy. So I had to fight tooth and nail for every frame. And I went out right from the word go and made it as hard as possible and played, my, played out of my skin and uh, came back and beat him 17-16 and, and, and get a place in the final of the World Championships. Uh, and that was in 2003. It was a great comeback. One of the best ever comebacks, actually, in the history of the Crucible. So... Uh, it was in, it, they showed it on BBC there only last week as one of the Crucible classics. And it was one of the greatest uh, comebacks ever there. So I'm, I'm very proud of that.
And I suppose, Ken, you speak about that, uh, facing a deficit. And do you take it at stage of one frame at a time? And do you start to feel that momentum yeah. turn? Do you feel that sort yeah. of twist that it's swinging, the balance is swinging to your favour as the balls keep going in? Absolutely, yeah. I think you just uh, you just take one frame at a time and just keep keep building bricks, building bricks, and, and anything can happen. You know, the pressure reverses onto the other player. And then you can see little tweaks, you know, little openings here and there. And, uh, and of course, body language is a huge thing as well. Mm. So, yeah, to come back and be him, who was one of the top players as well at the time, uh, was a fantastic victory for me. And do you have any memories of looking over at him and seeing his reaction as you started to peel in frame by frame you could by see, frame? You could, see, you could see his head going down a little bit. You know, he, he wanted to match over really quickly and be into the final and have a good rest. But... Uh, I kept 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 them there, kept them there, kept them there, and uh, it's amazing how the wheels torn, and they certainly torn for me. And uh, yeah, it was uh, one of those that you just pulled out of the fire. It was fantastic, great feeling. Uh, Ken, we're going to move on to the top coveted spot. I have an idea myself what this might <laughs> be. Uh, I say we all have a fair idea. It's probably one of the crowning moments, but you can cap it off by saying, "Is this your number one game for you?" Yeah, absolutely. I think winning the World Championships uh, in 97, that was my dream when I first turned professional. My dream when I was a kid, like when I was watching the snooker on the TV all those years ago. Uh, but to emulate what uh, Higgins did and what Dennis Taylor did in 85, Higgins in 82, and to be the next Irish man to, to lift that trophy. And of course, uh, I think the icing on the cake was beating Stephen Hendry in the final as well, uh, because he had, he had been unbeaten for the six yeah. years and was gone for six in a row. Uh, which was uh, 30 matches in a row, but uh, I beat him in his 30th match and uh, captured the, the World Championship trophy. I became world champion. And, and once you're world champion, you're world champion for life. You know, your name is on that cup and, and they can never scratch it off. You know, you're, you're in the history books. And I came home to one of the greatest welcomes that any sports person could ever come home to when I came back to, to Dublin and landed like on the flight. And uh, it, was just, uh, it was just incredible, you know. Yeah, and I suppose, Kane, in terms of becoming a world champion, we all hear about stories in boxing, about other sports, of someone being an amateur world champion, and they say, oh, well, unless you do it in the professional sense, it means nothing. It's going to be a career sort of unfilled. You've got to prove it with the big boys yeah, to earn their yeah. respect, mm. and you're never going to be respected as, as, as an all-time great or a, a real master at your craft until you win the big one. Uh, at, at, the, at the professional phase and being a world amateur champion as well mm. did you feel that the professional pressure of saying to yourself well if I don't win it at the seniors then what I do well I thought I thought yeah no I mean I was world junior world amateur uh, and going into that you know I thought that this was my chance to be a world professional champion this is what as I said I dreamed of and this was my opportunity and I wanted to take it try and win it first time because if you don't the sort of the board and becomes heavier you know it becomes a monkey on your back so I thought that was my opportunity try and seize the moment uh, as they say and uh, yeah to be and to be the only one who's ever won the world junior world amateur and the world professional even to this day uh, that's a nice feather in my cap as well so yeah fantastic and I suppose, Ken, lastly, before I let you go, in terms of that, we know the last two decades, two of the biggest names in world snooker and have dominated mm. the scene have been Ronnie O'Sullivan and Stephen Hendry. But to beat one, the, one of the biggest names on the mm. final must have made it also almost sweet or special that it's Stephen Hendry yeah. that you're putting away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think because he was, you know, he, he had won it seven times there. He'd been the greatest player at the Crucible. So to beat him, you know, at the top of his game as well in the 90s was, uh, was just the icing on the cake. And at every opportunity, I remind him of it as well, as much as possible. <laughs> uh, Stephen Hendry, that concludes uh, your top five games. Uh, to, this concludes episode one. We thank uh, Chloe Watkins for part one, for giving her top five games, and Stephen Hendry for part two, completing episode one. Uh, stay tuned for more episodes coming away. But Ken, for the moment, uh, stay safe and take care.